a special. We don't typically have specials on Sunday afternoon, but we're going to have a special this Sunday afternoon. Rachel told me that she was going to sing. <laughs> She's laughing. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> huh? I did. I also said that there was a difference between joking and lying. You remember that part? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, uh, no, I was just kidding. I'm trying to, uh, to, she's musically inclined, I can tell. Can, can anyone besides me figure that out? Because she knows the song. She taps her feet when we're singing. She, I mean, yeah, we'll get her up here. That was all what? Oh, I said she just needs to break out of her show. Yeah, she, she needs some help. I think you should help her. You guys do a duet. We'll call you the dynamic duet. All right, so we're in Romans chapter 5. And if you remember, what is Romans chapter 5 about? Who remembers? Faith. Faith. Hmm? <laughs> Faith. Huh? What? Faith is the wrong answer. So what were you going to say? <laughs> Sorry. We're, what? Seed of Adam. Seed of Adam. All right, so I gave out the title of the chapter, and I'm hoping that somebody can actually remember that. Yes. Oh, you got the right word, justified, okay? So, chapter 5, we're looking at principles of justification. And uh, we, we last week, we kind of talked about a, a few aspects of that. Um, we began talking about being justified by faith, right? And we looked at verse 1 and saw the, the past work of justification, if you remember that discussion. And this week, we're going to pick up uh, in verse 2, what I want to do, though, is I want to read verses 1 through 5 because that kind of, you know, it's a unit and it helps us a little bit better that way. So I'm going to read it, verses 1 through 5, starting in verse 1. It says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so. But we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So uh, we began looking at the principles of justification, verse 1, being the past work, justified. I am justified. That work was done in the past at Calvary. So now we're going to pick up with the second thought. There is, a, as there was a past work, there's also a present possession. So looking at verses 1 and 2, what is it that we possess now that we didn't possess before? Faith. All right. Okay. All right. Peace. A couple more words I guess you could throw out there. What? Hope. Hope. Okay. Justification. <laughs> We already got that word. That was used. Grace. What I was looking for was peace, access, rejoicing, maybe hope. <laughs> Those are the ones I was looking for. This is what we have now. This is a present possession that we have now. Um, we were once lost sinners, haters of God, desiring to walk according to the course of this world. But now, what? Are we haters of God now? No. Why? We have peace. We're now at peace. We're reconciled to God the Father through faith in Christ the Son, right? So, and you might not know this, maybe you do, maybe you don't, but every lost person is at war with God. Every lost person. Even those really good people that you know, those nice people, you know, like the lady down at Dunkin' Donuts that always gives you an extra donut and a little bit better coffee. As good as you might think they are, they're still at war with God. That's what the Bible teaches us. And they might not know that they're at war with God, but according to the Scriptures, and we'll get down to that a little bit later, uh, they are. Nonetheless, they are at war with God. Um, look at Romans chapter 8, verse 7. And uh, Brother Will wants you to read that. Romans 8, 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. 
All right, so enmity, enmity, enmity. What does that word sound like to you? Enemy. Yeah, because they're related. To be at enmity means that you are at war. You are an enemy. So it says that the carnal mind is an enemy of God. Now, you and I as believers, do we have a carnal mind? Un unfortunately, yeah, we do. It's still there. We're supposed to control it. We're supposed to bring it into captivity, every thought to the obedience of Christ. But we can think carnally, and when we do, we are at enmity with God too. But the lost person cannot think spiritually. They do not have the spirit. They are not new creatures in Christ. All they can do is think the old way. And they are at, at odds with God. Um, they're not subject to law of God. Now, later in Romans chapter 5, verse 10, Paul will actually describe the lost person as an enemy. He'll actually describe him as an enemy with Christ. But when we come to Christ by faith, we are justified. We are no longer considered at war with God. Our sins are gone. We're children of God. No longer enemies, but now at peace. So in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, therefore in being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a first thing that we now possess. It is a present possession as the result of the past work of being justified. We have peace. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 19. Who wants to read that? Do I have a volunteer? Looking for a volunteer, going, going, going. Yes, go. Yes, sir. Second Corinthians five nineteen. The word reconciliation is a really nice word. If you've ever been in a relationship you know, or married, and you've had a falling out, and then you are reconciled. You know the beauty of this word, right? It just helps you bring your thoughts back on everything else in life besides the fact that you are at war, if you will, with your beloved other, right? So reconciled means that there has been a falling out. Two sides or two people are at odds over something. Now, when we apply this to Christianity, when we apply it to ourselves and God, what that means is that God and I had a falling out. What caused that falling out? Sin. So God's not at fault then, is He? It's not His fault. It's our fault. We're the ones who messed up. Now, according to Romans 5.9... And uh, Romans 5, 9, we find that God's wrath is averted from us. And again, we're going to get down to that and study that a little bit more in depth. But instead of our sins being imputed to us, the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us. And we are reconciled to God. No longer at war. And that was done in Christ. So now we are, we are at peace. Right? I read an article, interesting interesting article yesterday I think it was um, about Japan in uh, in World War II what did we do to Japan does anybody remember what we did come on there's got to be somebody there that studied history in school at some point yeah what did we do we dropped some bombs we dropped one bomb on which city was first Hiroshima was first right three days later because Japan decided that they weren't going to give up. Then we dropped another one on Nagasaki, and then Japan gave up. Within a year after we bombed, and look, that was horrendous. We killed hundreds of thousands of innocent people that were not even in the military. Okay, That's the way we did war back World War II and before. There was no, let's spare the civilians. Actually, we went for cities. Okay? Everybody did, so don't think that America was bad. We were all bad. Makes sense. We are all bad. But, but within a year after that, suddenly, Japan and America are really good friends. 
we helped them write their constitution and we got them going and rebuilt their country and they like us. Which is interesting. We've got about, we've got about a thousand survivors from Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki living in America that are now American citizens. Many of them are American citizens. And they, they love us. Like, how could you love us? We just bombed your city, blew everything up. We took away everything from you. But they love us. Within a year's time, politics and money and all of that, we were reconciled. And now we're, we're at peace. And nobody in Japan goes, man, we hate it. Well, there's probably still a few older people that do. But nobody really goes, man, we hate America because they blew up our cities and destroyed everything, killed hundreds of thousands. Nobody talks like that. Nobody thinks like that. No, it's like, hey, let's buy tickets and go to Hawaii. Let's go see the beach. Oh, we go to Tokyo, right? So there's complete reconciliation between the two, two countries. And nobody thinks about the war between the Christian and God. When reconciliation comes, and it does through Christ, God's not thinking about the war and neither are we. We are at peace. We have peace with God because we have made peace with God. Peace with God, given to us by the God of peace, all right? Uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Who wants to read that? Hebrews 6, 19 and 20. Going, okay, go ahead, brother. Yeah. Uh, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, for which entereth into uh, that, where, uh, that within the veil. Uh, whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now suddenly, it's not just peace that we have, but we also have access. We have access. We have, as it says in verse 19, an anchor of the soul, sure and steadfast, which entereth in that within the veil, whether the forerunner, who's the forerunner? Jesus. Jesus. You think of the forerunner to Jesus' ministry was John the Baptist, but this is not talking about that. This is talking about going to heaven, and he is our forerunner, and he's made a high priest for us after the order of Melchizedek. And no, I don't want to get off into Melchizedek, okay? Uh, you're going to have to say, Pastor, who do you think Melchizedek is before I'm going to go there? And since I'm not going to call on you if you raise your hand, don't even, don't even start, okay? So, speaking of that, there is another interesting passage in Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 9, verses 6 through 8. And I need another volunteer to read. Who wants that one? Hebrews 9, 6 through 8. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate it. Hebrews 9, 6 through 8. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But unto the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself. And the heirs of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way to the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Do you remember that when Jesus was crucified, the sky was dark? And when he was crucified, something else happened. Do you remember what happened? Okay, that, yes, that came after the resurrection a few days later. But at the moment that Jesus died, what else happened? Yeah, the veil was ripped. All right, the veil was torn in two. And this signified that the way into the holiest of all was now open for us. All right? Jesus opened the door, if you will. We have access to the Father. Now, I want you to think about this because if you go back and think about the Old Testament temple, let's just go back to the Temple of Solomon because that was the big majestic one, right? That everybody wants to talk about. Um, you think back to the Temple of Solomon. If you know anything about the construction of it, and I'll just kind of lay out some things that will help you understand where I'm going from. But there was this place called the Holy of Holies. Now, in the Holy of Holies, that's where the Ark of God was. That's where the Shekinah glory was. And, you know, the mercy seat and the cherubim that faced inward. And, and that's where that was. That was the Holy of Holies. Nobody went in there except for the high priest. And he only went in once a year. And that's what I was talking about in the message this morning. All right. Outside of that was a place called the Holy Place. And that's where the candlestick was and the table of showbread. And the bread had to be exchanged. 
and the candles had to, you know, stay lit and the, uh, the altar of incense had to continue to burn. And so the priests were allowed to go in there, okay? But other than that, there were other places in the Temple of Solomon that had been built. There was a court of women that, is, that was built. There was also a court of the Gentiles. And this is where it gets interesting because with regards to the temple, which was built by Solomon, there was only so far that various people were allowed to go. You could only go so far. The Gentiles, and there were Gentiles who converted to you know, Judaism, uh, they could go no farther than the court of the Gentiles. They couldn't go any farther than that. That was it. That was, and that was, the, that was the place of worship that was the farthest away from the Holy of Holies. Okay? Even closer was the place that was called the court of the women. And the Jewish women could go closer to the Holy of Holies, closer than the Gentiles could, but they still could not go any closer than the court of, of women because women could not be priests and only priests could go into the holy place. So they were not allowed to go in. And that wasn't because they were misogynists. That was because that was the law of God. And so that's what they had to do. Then even closer was the holy place where the priest would minister and they would do that daily. And that's where the table of showbread was and the candlestick was. And then the room called the Holy of Holies, which was the place referred to in the book of Hebrews as the holiest of all, could only be entered once a year, only by the current high priest. And if these rules weren't followed, what would happen? Somebody was going to die, right? You remember that from the message this morning. According to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 8, this was the Holy Spirit's way of saying, the door's not open yet. But Jesus changed that. So in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 and 12, it says, But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now the way is open. You ever notice that little tidbit of information concerning the veil? We're talking about the veil. That was in Mark chapter 15. Did you ever notice that before? It's an important point. It's mentioned in a couple of places in the Gospels. I can't tell you exactly if it was two or three, but I know it's at least two. It's, it's very simple. When the veil was torn, that was God saying, okay, now the door is open. Now we have access. We didn't have it before. We're justified, according to Romans chapter 5, verse 1. We have the peace of God and we have access. But even beyond that, there's more. We have access into grace wherein we stand. In other words, we couldn't stand otherwise. We fail all, all the time miserably without God's grace. And this is where this is where I like to emphasize eternal security. We we do not fall, we stand. Do we fall? I should hope that every one of us would say yes after this morning's message, right? Yeah, we fall. Every day probably we fall, right? But we don't stay down, and that's the idea. There is no permanence to our fall. Eternal security. Alright? I know there can be questions about that. Like, first of all, Pastor, what do you mean eternal security? What that means is that once Jesus saves you, you're saved forever. You don't lose it. Now, I know some people have questions about that. They say, well, well, what if, you know, is it possible to deny Christ and thereby forfeit my salvation? Now, I don't know. Maybe you know somebody, but I personally, after 37 years of meeting Christians all over the world, I have never met a Christian that said, I don't want to be a Christian. I'd rather not have Jesus in my life. I want to go to hell. Never met one. I've met people that wanted to walk away from God and said, God, I don't want you in my life. But no one that actually wanted to turn in, you know, salvation, knowing that the result of that would be hell. You know what I'm saying? Nobody, I've never met anybody like that. But just for the sake of argument, let's say that there are a few proud that out there actually think that way. Okay. So the question would be then, is it possible to deny Christ and thereby forfeit your salvation? 
2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. Brother, can you read that? 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 13. So, if I am unfaithful, what does the Lord do? He's faithful. He's faithful. Even if I'm unfaithful. He cannot deny himself. What was that? Oh, is that Willie up there? Willie, are you talking, brother? No, I was just reading the Bible. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought he was answering a question or something. We were all waiting for your answer there. All right. So uh, he cannot deny himself. He's not going to. I'm sorry. What was that? Oh, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. And that dirty word you said a moment ago. We heard that too loud and clear. We got we got that. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No one you. All right. So. All right. Where was I? So. Even if we're faithless, he is faithful. So the answer to the question, is it possible to deny Christ? If it's not eternal salvation, then what would it be? What would we call it? Conditional salvation? If we don't call it eternal salvation, then what do I have to call it? Temporary. Temporary salvation? Yeah. Okay. Conditional? That's true. Conditional salvation? Unbiblical. 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 Yeah, you don't find those terms in the Bible. All you find in the Bible is everlasting life, eternal salvation, eternal life, you know, everlasting. You know, it's, it's always everlasting, eternal, forever, and that sort of thing. You never find anything conditional. So, uh, no, it's not possible to deny Christ and forfeit your salvation. Uh, who saved you? He did. So you didn't save yourself, right? If you didn't save yourself, you can't lose yourself. Who keeps you saved? Jesus. Kept by the power of God, right? First Peter 1 Peter 1.5. So you don't, you don't have to worry about that. What about this? What about this question? What if I cannot endure? This is another big question that some people have. What if I cannot endure? And there's kind of a catch there. Because you will endure. All right? You will endure. You must endure. Why? Thank you. Because God's the one that carries you along, right? Two verses, Philippians 1.6. Uh, Isaac, why don't you take that? Philippians 1.6. And uh, Rachel, why don't you take uh, Jude chapter 1, verse 24. We were actually there this morning for this morning's message. I didn't actually realize that. But yeah, we get that verse twice today. Philippians 1.6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you, all right, when is the day of Jesus Christ? The final, the final day, what does it mean? When he comes back. When he comes back, okay? Now, if you want to talk about pre, mid, or post, or whatever, fine. We'll talk about that later. But right now, the day of Christ is the day that Jesus comes back, okay? I'm a pre, I'm, I'm pre-trib guy, right? If you are mid or post, you can have all my books. You can have my house. You can have my car. It doesn't matter to me. I won't need them anymore. I'm going. You want to stay behind? That's your business. I'm leaving. Okay? So um, it, we can argue about that later if you like. But the fact is, the day of Christ is the rapture. Now, some of us aren't going to make it to the rapture, maybe. I mean, let's say Jesus doesn't come for another 50 years. Some of us in this room, some of you in this room won't be alive 50 years from now. <laughs> right? But... And, and it'll end for you then. But what's going to continue until that day, according to Philippians 1.6? The day of Christ is the rapture or death. Let's just make it simple. What will continue until that day, according to Philippians 1.6? Jesus' work in us. 
He has begun a good work in you, and he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. In other words, he's still working on you, and he's going to continue working on you until the day you die or the day he comes to take you home, whichever comes first. That's how long he's going to work on you. All right? Uh, Jude one twenty four. All right, so according to Jude one twenty four, what is the Lord doing for me right now? Okay, so he's keeping me from falling. What's he going to do in the future? Right, he's going to present us before the Father, right? So <clears throat> he's, he's keeping me now. Did you fall today? Yeah, me too. We're just a couple of low-down, dirty, rotten, backstabbing sinners, aren't we? So when it says he keeps you from falling, that can't be true then, right? Well, of course it's true. It's in God's Word. It makes it true. Whether you understand it or not, it makes it true. He, it's not the idea that you won't stumble. It's the idea that you will not stay down. That's the whole idea. Has anybody ever gone horseback riding? Yeah. Did, did you fall off? Yes. Yeah? You fell off too? How many people have been horseback riding? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you fell off? Raise your hand. Does that count? Now, see, I didn't fall off. You know why? No, my quarter ran out before I got off the horse. Anyway. Uh, uh, no. No, I, I, rode, I rode a horse down in Chejido, but, you know, there's a guy walking beside you and the horse is not allowed to run too fast, so I never had an opportunity to fall off, you know. That was my horseback riding days. So... Uh, but you got back up apparently and you got back on the horse because you're out in the middle of nowhere how else are you going to get home right and you keep riding well that's the idea there you don't stay down the Lord will not allow you to stay down okay so what if you can't endure well I'm going to tell you right now you can't endure but you don't have to because you're kept by the power of God it is Christ doing the work in you alright um, next question what if I fall into sin I used, to, I used to go door knocking in the States. We, we don't do that over here because nobody, nobody is opening their door to a strange Westerner. And I'm a strange Westerner, okay? I got it. But when I was in the States, I'd go door knocking, and my wife and I, we, we got stories. We could tell you stories that you would not believe. You knock at a door, and you meet somebody, and, uh, hi, I'm Jim Taylor. I'm from Victory Baptist Church. That was my church in the States. And uh, I'm here, we're, we're having revival next week, and I'm here to invite people to revival services. Would you like to come? And, uh, you know, I met people, oh yeah, I'm saved. I got saved 20 years ago. I got saved 30 years ago. And they ain't darkened the doorstep of a church in 30 years. You know, they got Budweiser cans thrown in the floor of their house. You know, they look like sin just beat them up and ran them over with a steamroller or something, you know. You can just tell. The way the transgressor is hard, you can see it, right? Don't judge a book by the cover, Pastor. Well, you do, right? You're walking down a dark alley, you see a couple of guys with tattoos and chains and black leather jackets, you feel comfortable, don't you? Yeah, you know as well as I do. We all do that. And so, and so I meet these guys, and they tell me that they got saved 20 or 30 years ago, but they are not living a Christian life. They've never lived a Christian life. They just got their... You know, fire insurance from hell or something, I guess. That's what they were thinking. They're good to go. I, I can't judge a person like that. I really don't know what really happened in them. But I can tell you this. The Bible says that we're to be new creatures. And I'm kind of wondering when it's going to start for them, you know. The reality is, what if I fall into sin? Will I lose my salvation if I die with unconfessed sin in my life? So what if you're you're walking down the street with your best, best bud, whoever your best bud happens to be, and you're talking and... He says, no, I'm telling you that the Washington Redskins, I'm not giving that name up, are better than the Dallas Cowboys. Any Cowboys fans in here? No? If you're a Cowboys fan, you know that you would never agree to that statement. I mean, there's, there's no deeper football hatred than the Cowboys and the Redskins. Okay? So that your bud, who's a, who's a Cowboys fan, says, he says, he says, you've got to be out of your mind. What's the matter with you? And you look over him and you say, you're crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. And you step out across the road 
after having, you know, said very mean and nasty things to your buddy, and you get hit by a bus. Boom. So you die with unconfessed sin. Heaven or hell? Where are you going? So you're going to heaven, right? Why? Well, Romans 5.20 is why. Who wants to read Romans 5.20? Nobody wants to read Romans 5.20? Okay, you do it. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So... Okay, that's good enough. You can stop there. All right. So the law enters that the offense might abound. In other words, all of a sudden that little bitty sin seems really big because the law of God says it's a sin. But where sin abounded, what happens next? Grace is much more abound, right? There's always more grace than there is sin, if I can put it in those simple terms. How about 1 John 1, 9? Who has not read yet? First John 1 9. Who has not read yet? Who wants to read? Oh, no. Allie. Huh? Yeah, he read. Oh, he read? Did y'all hear that? Because that's important. Alright. So, alright, so you sinned. You're kept by the power of God. Remember the sermon this morning? Iniquity. In our, what? Holy things. And the way that that becomes no longer an issue is what? Christ. Your, your flesh, this flesh is not going to heaven. This flesh is cursed by sin. Paul said, the sin that's in my members. I know that it means both no good thing, right? Okay, it's not going. You're going to be changed. You're going to, your corruption will put on incorruption. The mortal will put on immortality. But this sinful body does not get to go. Thank God it does not get to go. Frankly, do not want to deal with me for eternity. I mean, the last 59 years have been hard enough, you know, for an eternity. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. We stand. And in those times when we stumble into sin... We do not stay down. We get back up and we continue to stand. Psalm 37, 23 and 24 says this. It says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. There's another verse in Proverbs I like, Proverbs 24, 16. It says, A just man falleth seven times and riseth again. The idea there is not that you keep counting and go, oh man, that was number six, I better be careful. It's not like a cat with nine lives, okay? It's, a, it's kind of a euphemism to say that you're going to fall again and again and again, but you're going to get back up again and again and again. All right? You're not going to stay down. Um, the wicked, however, shall fall into mischief. So getting back to Romans 5.2, where we didn't make a whole lot of headway today, but that's fine. How does Paul end the thought? He ends with rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So we rejoice... That we have hope, but it's not, I mean, it's not like, I hope so, you know. You know, hey, are you going to get a new car next year? Man, I hope so. It's not that kind of hope. It's an assurance that we have of the future. It's a sure hope, a hope that we have as an anchor of the souls. Remember reading that in Hebrews 6.19? All right, so that's what that was all about. So we'll stop here and we'll come back next week to chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, where we find continuing growth. So we've got... Something going on, something that happened in the past, we were justified. Now we have a present possession, we have peace, we have access, we have hope, and uh, what was the other thing that we mentioned? There were four of them, right? Anyway, we have all of those things, but now there's something that is continuing from this point, and that's going to be maturity and confidence, and then we'll look at something in the future. So we'll stop here, all right? Any questions or comments on that? No questions? No comments? In that case, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Yes, sir? Uh, Pastor, what is the order of the <laughs> <laughs> You're fired. <laughs> uh,
At least you didn't ask me who he was. <laughs> yeah, I might do that. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe I'll take a break from Romans and next week just talk about Mel- how many people would would enjoy having a very open discussion about Melchizedek next week. Yes, sir. Yeah. Come on, that wasn't very high. I got like two hands there. Okay. All right, Melchizedek. Yes. Maybe I'll do something on Melchizedek next week. Just take a break from Romans for a week. Okay. Yeah, that ought to keep me busy this week. Yeah. All right, let's close in prayer then. Any other questions or comments? No? All right.